for this week's video, I would like to review the Knox version of the Holy Bible. This particular edition is by Baronius Press. It's printed in the Philippines. It is 8 and 9 sixteenths inches tall, 6 inches wide, and 1 and 15 sixteenths inches thick, so almost 2 inches thick. And as we normally do, I will compare it in size to some other Bibles. This is the Catholic Book Publishing Company, NABRE, that I reviewed some time ago. It's not quite as wide as the Baronius Press edition, about the same size otherwise. This is an old P.J. Kennedy and Sons uh, Dewey Reams Bible. And the Knox edition is a bit taller, a bit thicker, similar in width. And then finally, um, the Revised New Jerusalem Bible, which came out in 2019 or early 2020, depending on where you are, is a bit taller, quite a lot thicker. And then, uh, just for fun, I have here a daily Roman, Roman Missal. And the Roman Missal is actually a thicker book but not as wide, not uh, nearly as tall. Um, when you get this, when it comes in the mail, it comes with uh, an essay called On Englishing the Bible by uh, Ronald Knox. Here's the back of it. So you can pause that and get some information. Interesting middle name, eh? Died the same year that Einstein did, I believe. So that comes, and then you don't get a box, but you get this uh, piece of cardstock that's printed. Gives you the ISBN, gives you the title, so it's covered, it's hardcover with black leather. They give you their measurement of the dimensions, which differ than mine. They give you the page count. On the back, more information about Father Knox and another little biographical snippet, so pause that if you please. When it comes, it is uh, arranged something like this. And uh, all of that together is wrapped in transparent plastic. So let's open it up and take a look at the design of the page. It's a single text column broken in paragraphs. This column is 117 millimeters wide as I measure it. If you're used to English units, um, there are 25.4 millimeters in an inch. There are about, on a closely spaced line, without capital letters or M's, or th a lot of M's, things like that, that take up a lot of space, you get about 85 characters a line. And there can be as many as 48 lines of text on a page. You don't have that many here because you have a break. Page dimensions are 218 millimeters tall, or 8.6 inches tall, 142 millimeters wide, that's 5.6 inches wide. As far as I can tell, everywhere I've looked, the text is line matched, which means that the line of text printed on the opposite page to this one is lined up with it. So it is a line matched text. The font is uh, generally neither very thin, nor is it very bold. Uh, personally, I dislike the very thin fonts, the very faint ones. Margins at the top of the page from this line to the top, it's 14 to 16 millimeters at the bottom, from the bottom of this line to the edge is 12 to 14 millimeters. The inner margin can be as much as 13 millimeters. The outer range is between 12 and 14 millimeters. The font in the text, I uh, compare it to Times New Roman. It appears to be about a 10 point font. The line height is 3.7 millimeters, which is 10.5 points. So it seems to match fairly well with the height of the capitals. And uh, I think that's a decent reasonable line spacing. The wider the column is, your eye is going to want more relief 
by having more line spacing. And generally, uh, publishers do that. They make the lines farther apart, the wider their, mar the wider their columns of text are. Verse numbers are inside the par uh, I'm sorry, alongside the text, and there is no mark inside the paragraphs as there is in, say, the Jerusalem Bible to indicate breaks uh, between one verse and another. So it's sometimes difficult to tell which verse you're in. You can approximate it, but not know exactly. Uh, some translations are somewhat word for word, and in that case, they can mark uh, words that the translators have supplied to make the text make sense. And they do that often in italic font. You'll find no italic font here, and that's because the Knox translation is uh, very free, uh, it's explanatory, interpretive. One term that's used these days for such a translation is dynamic equivalence. Um, quotations from the Old Testament that appear in the New Testament are not uh, set apart. They're not indented or set apart from the rest of the text. They don't appear in quotation marks. Uh, here is typically what you'll see. Here's a quotation uh, from the Old Testament. And if we look down below, the footnote gives the source as Psalm 31, 1 and 2. That would be th Psalm 32 in the most modern Bibles. They're using the old Latin and Septuagint numbering system here. There. Um, the font down here in these page bottom notes is about an eight point font. These notes are in a single column. It's 117 millimeters wide, and I count about 105 to 110 characters per line. Uh, one only with difficulty can go back from the note into the text because this number isn't tagged back. So that actually that reference goes back uh, into the text to uh, Romans chapter 5 verse 1 and it would have been much easier for me to find that had it actually said 5.1 down here but it does not uh, I like the paper quite a lot in this Bible I measure the sheet thickness to be 53 micrometers so I estimate the paper weight on the basis of that at 48 GSM, that's grams per square meter the surface is very nearly matte so you only see just the slightest sheen probably right through there on the camera not very disturbing at all uh, it's a white color with a slight beige tinge to it and the show through we can see it but it does not disturb me so you can see print from the opposite page through here but it really is not uh, much of an issue so here we're looking at page 552 I'm going to lift it and press it down so that 550, page 550 is behind it and that is about the range of darkness that you'll see darker on the left not quite so dark on the right in the New Testament I'm happy to say that the words of Christ are not in red so if we go to one of the Gospels here we are in Luke and you don't see any red letters uh, to my mind that's a good thing uh, red letters can actually uh, cause eye strain, they're difficult to print, uh, there are issues with show through, so I'd prefer not to have them. They're a rather modern invention too, they only sh started showing up in Bibles in the 1890s. One of the things that's interesting about the Knox translation is that he retains a thou for the singular, uh, and it isn't simply when referring to deity, it is uh, when the person being referred to is a single person. So thou and you are distinct, and you refers to uh, multiple people. Another thing Knox does that I like is he does not capitalize pronouns that refer to deity, even though I have no doubt that he believes that Jesus is God and a member of the Holy Trinity. Um, there are no book introductions. It just moves from one book to the next. Um, Book titles are at the center top of the page. To my mind, that's not the best place for them. The title of the book should be on the outside, and the contents of the page should be beside the book on the outside, which makes it very easy to find uh, your way through the Bible if you're trying to move from one reference to another rapidly. Um, 
the page numbers are on the outside top, which is prime real estate, and uh, you can put the page number anywhere you please. Usually you're not referring to those at all. They're not really needed. There are no headings either alongside the top, uh, inside the text, or along the top of the text as, as is normally found. And there is no uh, two-line large uh, chapter number here. Instead, you have a drop cap that spans the two lines. And the chapter is given in the older style way of a capital word chapter followed by the number. As far as I can tell, all the books of the Bible begin on a separate page. First Timothy, Second Timothy. Titus begins on a separate page. If we look at the smaller books at the end. You may wonder why I, I mention this. That uh, seems like a small matter. Well, for some people, this is very important. So all the books of this Bible begin on separate pages, as far as I can tell. This uh, Bible is definitely sewn, and you can see the lines of thread here between the 8th and ninth chapters of the Apocalypse in the back of the Bible. So I count five lines of stitching here. At the end of the Apocalypse, or Book of Revelation, there's a blank back of the last page, and then there's one blank sheet of paper which gives you two blank pages for notes. There's a decor decorated liner. It's paper, so this is a paper paste down with a leather overboard cover. There is no map, uh, no maps at all, no concordance. There are two ribbon markers. The ribbon markers are a quarter of an inch wide. They're 290 millimeters long, and I think that's long enough. They uh, come out to the corner where they can, you can use them easily. They're cut a little ragged. I don't know if you can see the thread that's coming out. But they weren't cut quite as, sharp, as uh, carefully as they could have been. And the ribbons do want to come out at an angle rather than along the length of the book. But those are minor worries. Page edges are gilt. Head and tail bands are yellow. And you can actually see the reflection of the tail band in the gilt itself. If you look carefully, it's kind of a neat effect. Leather overboard, as we mentioned, paper liner. It does lie open and quite flat in Genesis. And the good thing about that is you don't need to worry about using a book stand. The Bible doesn't want to flop close, so you don't have to dedicate a hand to holding it open. That's a nice thing. So as flat as you please there. There is a curvature into the gutter issue, so if you have older eyes, this kind of a slope may cause you trouble. You can always adjust the book to flatten the side of the page you want to read. If we go to the front, you see the same decorated paper liner, a uh, half title page, which is blank on the opposite side, and the title page translated from the Latin Vulgate, Monsignor Ronald Knox. This is Baronius Press, I believe I pronounced that correctly. This is a 2012 edition. It has the nothing obstructs and the let it go forth from um, an Archbishop of Westminster, 2012, the Feast of the Epiphany. Right, so mine is apparently the second printing. There's the ISBN. All rights reserved. We come to the contents page. And you'll see that it includes, um, as is typical for a Catholic Bible, it includes the Deuterocanonicals in their normal order. Uh, you will notice as well that uh, it's Tobias, um, Isaiah, uh, Ose. So you'll see endings that are a little different. Um, what are normally given as First and Second Samuel in modern Bibles are First and Second Kings, First and Second Kings, and then Third and Fourth Kings. 
or going back to the ending issue, uh, you have uh, Abdias instead of Obadiah, Habakuk, Siphonius. So some of the spellings are a bit different. Malachias, and the two books of Maccabees with the CH in there. A forward. This is by Scott Hahn, I believe, so we'll hold it here and let you pause and read it if you like. I'm not going to make any comments about it. Fairly self-explanatory. You come to a publisher's note, and I think the interesting thing in the note is that he mentions that in a handful of passages, the Vulgate text yields no tolerable sense, or sometimes quarrels with the context. In those cases, he's rendered from the Hebrew and gives a literal translation of the Latin in a footnote. And after the publisher's note, you're in the book of Genesis. We'll have some font comparisons in a moment, but first let's take a look at the text up close. Uh, it's kind of an interesting font. It's very rounded. And look at the upper portion of the T's, how short that is. There, that one as well. Um, I like the tracking. It's uh, not too close. The letters are not too closely packed, nor are the words. And we've mentioned the uh, line spacing already. It seems adequate. It's not luxurious, but it seems quite uh, well done. And uh, also you see very little clutter, noise from the opposite page on your eyes. You can certainly make out oil used for anointing from uh, a page back, but it's very faint and doesn't seem to cause trouble, at least not for me. So we still have the Knox version on the right, and now this is the revised New Jerusalem Bible on the left which has uh, the dot that I mentioned earlier that separates verses. This has a little better line spacing on the left, uh, but the characters are printed less boldly than they are on the right. I like the darker font on the right better than that on the left. Size-wise, they uh, appear to be quite close. And now on the left I have the uh, N-A-B-R-E, and uh, it's um, more closely spaced lines, a darker font. I do prefer the darker font on the left, but I do like the larger size of the font on the right. Now on the left, I have my old uh, P.J. Kennedy and Sons uh, Dewey Reams Bible, and uh, as you can see, this is a yellowed paper, and there's quite a lot of show, show through there. Ghosting is much more of an issue on the Bible on the left than it is on the right. At some point I intend to get the Baronius Press Dewey Reams Bible and look at the show through and the print there, but uh, clearly uh, this is superior here on the right to that on the left. What I want to do next is just allow you to pause the video on a few sections of scripture that are well known um, and let you read the text itself to see if this is the sort of translation that you would like to read. So here's Genesis chapter 1, the first few verses. This is the account of the birth of Moses. This is the first chapter of the book of Job. The 22nd Psalm. The 53rd chapter of Isaiah, or Isaiah. This is the first chapter of Luke's Gospel. When Gabriel comes to a city of Galilee called Nazareth, the beginning of John's Gospel, and finally, 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Those of you who've been watching my channel for some time will realize that one of my issues with modern translations is that the style is often sort of dull. And I think it's because of um, professional English style uh, police that these translation committees hire. Would they have allowed uh, Knox, had they been in charge of his edition, to have said uh, Daniel had been making sad cheer? 
I don't think they would, but I really like that. Um, now this might be difficult to do in a word-for-word -word translation, but I like to use alongside of a formal equivalence translation one like this, one that uh, is more interpretive. And if you look down here in 10.6, you'll see another word. Um, how likely do you think it is that a modern translation would have a word like crescent in it? And yet, that word isn't that hard. Um, I was reminded when I saw it, when I learned that word, I was a teenage boy, and I was reading this book, Conan the Conqueror. It's an old Lancer paperback. And there's the word crescent, bottom line. So it's, it's in stories written for teenage boys. Uh, clearly it's a word that's not too hard to appear in the Bible. And I really like the fact that uh, Knox is not at all shy about uh, using a rich vocabulary. Here's a second example, and indeed all those who are resolved to live a holy life in Christ Jesus will meet with persecution while the rogues and the mountebanks go on from bad to worse. I like this choice of word mountebanks here. And I think it's very unlikely that a modern translation that has an advisor to the translation committee uh, for English style would allow a word like that to go forward because somebody might have to go and look in a dictionary. Modern translations like the English Standard Version or even remove simple words like team, routed, burst, clan, bosom, paramour. Um, they're not likely to retain mountebank. I'm glad Knox did. Sometimes um, Knox's renderings are just very good. Uh, this is Philippians chapter 3, verses 9 and 10. In him I would render my account, not claiming any justification that is my own work given me by the law, but the justification that comes from believing in Jesus Christ, God's gift on condition of our faith. Him I would learn to know, and the virtue of his resurrection, and what it means to share his sufferings, molded into the pattern of his death, in the hope of achieving resurrection from the dead. It's uh, interesting to compare the Dewey Reims, which you're looking at here with Knox, Looking at uh, 1 Thessalonians 3, verses 2 and 3. And we sent Timothy, our brother, and the minister of God and the gospel of Christ, to confirm you and exhort you concerning your faith, that no man should be moved in these tribulations. For yourselves know that we are appointed thereunto. Uh, Knox kind of brings this to life in a different way. Um, by translating it in a different way. While we send our brother Timothy, who exercises God's ministry in preaching the gospel of Christ, to confirm your resolution and give you the encouragement your faith needed, there must be no wavering amidst these trials. You know well enough that this is our appointed lot. Um, but I'm not always um, convinced that uh, Knox has made the best choice of wording. Here in uh, Romans 8 is an example where Paul is talking about uh, our guilty flesh. But instead of flesh, uh, Knox uses the word nature. And um, if you come down to verse 12, it says, uh, Therefore, brother, nature no longer has any claim upon us uh, if you live a life of nature. And... Um, when I think of nature, it connotes to me uh, a day in a national park, uh, spring morning in a meadow, uh, that kind of thing. So I'm just not sure that this works well here. Uh, perhaps it worked better in the 1930s and 40s than it does now. There's an, another kind of odd rendering, uh, Daniel chapter 12, verse 1. Time then that Michael should be up and doing. It's just kind of odd. I suppose over time I could get used to this, and I think maybe what Knox is doing is he's signaling to us that uh, he believes the underlying text is poetic. Perhaps I should read on Englishing the Bible more carefully, but this is this strikes me as a bit odd, and now I saw the Lord standing above the altar. We're in Amos chapter 9. 
Smite column there, he cried. Lintel there dislodge. Just a little uh, odd sounding. We're here in Isaiah chapter 7. Sign you ask none, but sign the Lord will give you. Maid shall be with child and shall bear a son. I want to give you the flavor of the footnotes uh, just briefly. We'll look at this one and um, Matthew chapter 24. He says that when the temple would be destroyed is answered in the greater part of verses 4 through 35. And verse 36 answers the question, when should the world be brought to an end? The uh, footnotes draw attention to pecu peculiarities in the Vulgate, as here at 1 Corinthians 15:51, uh, Here is a secret I will make known to you. We shall all rise again, but not all of us will undergo the change I speak of. So if we go down and look at footnote 7, the Greek manuscripts, he says, are strangely divided. Some read the text given here, uh, but there is better support for the reading, we shall not all fall asleep, but we shall all be changed. Give you, to give you a sense for how interpretive the uh, translation is, here's uh, 1 John 4, 14 in the Dewey Reams, and it says, and we have seen and do testify. And um, I don't have the Latin, I don't read Latin, but uh, that matches the Greek pretty well, which says, um, and we have seen and witness. But it's interesting what Knox does. Knox inserts the word apostles so this is what I mean by uh, an explanation, a uh, translation like Knox's, like the New English Bible, the Jerusalem Bible, often help the reader in, in this way, by in interpolating explanations into the translation. While we're here in First John, we'll take a quick look at the Three Witnesses passage. He it is, Jesus Christ, whose coming has been made known to us by water and blood, Water and blood as well, not water only, and we have the Spirit's witness that Christ is the truth. Thus we have a threefold warrant in heaven. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. Three who are yet one, and we have a threefold warrant on earth, the Spirit, the water, and the blood. And he has a footnote here. So we'll go down and read his footnote, which says, This verse does not occur in any good Greek manuscript, but he adds, the Latin manuscripts may have preserved the true text. So unlike uh, most modern textual critics, uh, Knox um, is at least willing to consider that the Three Witnesses passage is genuine. Since Knox's translation was accomplished back in the 1930s and 1940s, you wouldn't expect to have modern uh, approaches to gender inclusiveness in the text. And so you see here, the charity of most men will grow cold as they see wickedness abound everywhere, but that man will be saved who endures to the last. Now we'll just uh, quickly show you the revised New Jerusalem Bible for the same passage. And it reads, uh, The love in most people will grow cold, but anyone who endures to the end will be saved. So you've gotten rid of men, and you've gotten rid of man. Psalm 144, uh, 145 in the Hebrew is an acrostic, which means each verse begins with a different letter in the Hebrew alphabet. And... Um, Knox has tried to do the same thing. I think he succeeded in doing the same thing in English. In fact, he's uh, because he's not translating the Hebrew but the Latin, he actually has this portion of the psalm which is missing from the Hebrew, Hebrew-based translations. Um, my thanks to the viewer who pointed this out to me, this practice of uh, bolding the initial letters that mapped to uh, the English acrostic. Uh, otherwise, I probably would have missed it.
So for our summary, let me just say that it's a free translation. Um, I prefer my primary Bible to be a literal translation, a word-for-word -word one. But if I were using the Douay Reims as a primary, then this would seem to be a very good um, Vulgate-based complement to it. Um, I'm not a big fan of a very wide column like this. You may be, however. This may help you uh, synthesize the meaning of the text to have it formatted, formatted this way. The uh, paper is very good, and the print is not bad. Uh, show through is not an issue. Uh, you have gilt page edges. You have a leather overboard volume, uh, which seems to be well bound. It's uh, stitched with five lines of stitching, so it should hold up well. Um, so with that, I'll conclude this uh, review of the Knox version. I uh, appreciate your watching, uh, and remember if you did like the video, to like it. And uh, if you haven't done so already, please subscribe to the channel.